This episode contains distressing themes and descriptions of violence. This podcast is intended for a mature audience. Listener caution is advised. A couple living on a farm in Kemsey, Worcestershire had been having issues with their septic tank for some time. Two maintenance companies had been employed to fix the problem, but frustratingly it was still blocked. On July 12th, 2019, a third company sent out a worker to drain the septic tank on the 500-acre farm. While emptying the tank, the pipe suddenly became blocked. When the worker cleared the obstruction, he discovered a mass of human hair was causing the problem. He thought it was an unusual amount to find, but continued with his duties. Work stopped once again when another object was found. This time it was more than just hair. It was a human skull. Welcome to Season 8, Episode 12 of They Walk Among Us, a podcast dedicated to UK true crime. Kemsey is a rural village in Worcestershire. Located just a few miles south of Worcester and bordered by the River Severn, Kemsey is said to be one of the oldest villages in the county. Its population is increasing, but locals are keen to ensure the area keeps its rural charm. David Venables was raised in Kemsey, the oldest of two sons born into a farming family in the early 1930s. His father had purchased some land in the village in 1942, where the family business began. Venables left school seven years after they had occupied the farm and went straight to working the land. He was in his mid-twenties in 1957 when he met his future wife Brenda at a Worcester and Kidderminster Young Farmers event at the Droitwich Winter Gardens. Around three years later, they married in Rushok, where Brenda was raised. They honeymooned in Jersey, an extremely popular destination for newlyweds at the time. The couple returned and temporarily moved in with Venable's parents. Before the marriage, his father generously offered his son a plot of land on which to build a home. The offer was accepted, and the property was completed in February 1961, ready for the young couple to start a new chapter in their lives. They called the new building Quaking House Farm, constructed on 500 acres of land along Bessman's Lane in Kemsey. Venables worked the land he was given, making money off his own growing wheat and sugar beet. Brenda did everything she could to support her husband helping around the farm and always making sure dinner was on the table. Time passed and the business steadily prospered, but Brenda felt something was missing. She longed for a child, however the couple had not been able to conceive. Brenda struggled with depression for many years, but fertility issues were not the only reason she was unhappy. Her mental state was not helped by the fact that her husband was rarely affectionate and was known to have affairs. Tensions in the household came to a head in early May 1982. Around 12pm on Tuesday, May 4th, David Venables arrived at the Worcester police station and reported that his wife had been missing since the previous morning. Venables explained that he had spent the evening of Sunday the 2nd with Brenda in their living room, 
watching a news report on the Falklands War as she played with their new puppy on the carpet. After this, he said she had gone to bed. The next morning, Venables awoke and realised that Brenda was not next to him, and when he went downstairs, the front door and the porch door were wide open. Venables told the police that he had gone out looking for his wife after talking to Brenda's longtime friend, Vicky Jennings. Vicky had helped Venables search the banks of the River Severn for hours, but they found no trace of Brenda. Venables asked if a police dog could be brought in to help. Over the next few days, the police searched the farmhouse, the outbuildings, the fields and nearby waterways. A helicopter was used to conduct aerial surveillance of the farm as officers examined the River Severn by boat. David Venables spoke to the Worcester News at the time and said, She has never done anything like this before, and I haven't the faintest idea what has happened to her. I have been unable to sleep a wink since she left, and I can only hope and pray that she is safe. Venables made it clear to investigators that his wife was in a fragile mental state. Many people believe that Brenda had taken her own life in a moment of desperation. Her parents, Harold and Winifred, whom she had cared for before she went missing, were heartbroken, as were her sisters. Eventually, the investigation stalled and was occasionally reviewed over the years, and Brenda's name even came up during the Fred and Rose West investigation. However, it was as if she had simply vanished. Subsequently, David Venables moved to another part of Kemsey after selling Quaking House Farm to his nephew Andrew in 2014. Four years after purchasing the farm, Andrew Venables and his wife Jessamy began to notice issues with the septic tank close to their home. It was not emptying correctly, so they called a maintenance company to carry out some checks. While draining the tank, the workers found clumps of hair and small bones that they believed to have come from a dog or animal of a similar size, so they removed the bones and threw them aside. Problems with the tank persisted, so workers returned. More small bones were found blocking the pipe, and again they were discarded. A year later, the tank again stopped emptying, so a further call-out needed to be made. However, this did not solve the problem. Growing frustrated, Andrew and Jessamy made another call for assistance, contacting Aqua Cleansing, a draining services company based in Worcester. The operative, who was sent out on July 12, 2019, Alistair Pitt, had only been employed by the company for a few weeks, but he knew how to operate the pump and drain the tank. He drove a larger vehicle and used more substantial equipment than the operatives who had visited the property in the past. As the water from the septic tank was sucked up into a waste tank on his truck, Alistair Pitt noticed the pipe was getting clogged. He removed a large clump of hair from the inside. Pitt then looked into the septic tank and saw what appeared to be a bag or some kind of sack. He used a garden hoe to pull the material out of the tank and placed it on the ground. When it fell open, he saw bones and thought they were far too big to have come from a dog. With the tank almost empty, Alistair Pitt could see something large and round at the bottom. He reached down with the hoe and turned it over. Pitt immediately recognised it as a human skull and told Andrew Venables to call the police.
once the area was cordoned off. Crime scene investigators began collecting evidence from the septic tank. They recovered a skull, a pelvis, thigh bones and other small pieces of bone. They also found female underwear, a bra and fabric from clothing that was later dated back to the 1970s. The discovery stunned the quiet village of Kemsey. Locals who had lived there for decades immediately thought back to Brenda Venable's disappearance in 1982. One said, I remember well at the time the police came along and they were looking through all the barns and going through the hay. They were looking for this woman about 48 hours after she disappeared. That went on for a while, and they had a helicopter up looking, which at the time was a bit of a novelty. Of course, they didn't find anything. In the days after the remains were found, Detective Chief Inspector Carl Moore from the West Mercia Police explained that the investigation was still in its early stages. He said, We are treating this as an unexplained death and are awaiting the results of a post-mortem examination. This could be a lengthy process, but we will continue to update the public in due course. On July 19th, one week after the discovery, DCI Moore announced that the post-mortem had been completed and the pathologist determined that the remains belonged to an adult female. The bones were due to be forensically tested in an attempt to obtain DNA. The detective said, We are aware this is concerning for the community of Kemsey, the wider Worcestershire area and for those with missing family or friends. There is a lot of speculation surrounding the remains. These types of discoveries are rare, and I would like to reassure people that we are doing our utmost to identify the remains so that a family can have closure and lay their loved one to rest. Unfortunately, this can be a lengthy process, but we are committed to identifying who this is and will update the community in due course. Just over a week later, investigators turned up at the home of 86-year-old David Venables on Elgar Drive in Kemsey. They had a warrant to search the property and authorization to arrest him on suspicion of murder. Venables had moved to the peaceful cul-de-sac when he sold Quaking House Farm to his nephew years prior but his neighbours never really got to know the elderly farmer well. He often had the blinds shut at the front of the detached property and only left to get into his red estate car that he kept on the driveway. One neighbour said, These things don't happen too often, luckily. It's quite astonishing to actually find somebody in a cesspit. A police van, two patrol vehicles and two unmarked cars were parked on the quiet street as investigators began searching Venable's home and car while he was taken to the station for questioning. When he was informed that human remains had been found in the septic tank on the property he had owned and the police believed the remains belonged to Brenda, Venables replied, "'What evidence have you got?' These bones? Are you sure it's my wife? Venables was told that the police were still investigating, and he claimed to have no knowledge of the remains whatsoever. When asked about the septic tank, he told detectives that he had always emptied it himself. Venables stressed in the interview that he had emptied the tank in 1982 and again before he sold the farm in 2014, and numerous times during the two decades before his wife went missing. He stated, There was absolutely nothing in there when I emptied it. 
If something was in there, it would be perfectly obvious. As investigators turned over Venable's home, they discovered a notepad in the back of his car and a sheet of paper with Venable's handwriting on it. It read in part, This is a true and honest statement of fact with regard to the disappearance of my wife Brenda Margaret in May 1982. The evening before we had been watching television about the invasion of the Falkland Islands. We discuss money which we would require for our holiday in Europe. I thought that a holiday would be beneficial for Brenda. We went to bed at 10.30pm and about 6.30am I woke up and she wasn't there. I assumed she'd gone downstairs to make some tea. After a short while, she didn't appear. At the same time as Brenda's disappearance, Fred West of Gloucester was picking up women. In fact, after Brenda went missing, I had a phone call from a lady to say that she had been picked up by West and had escaped. Since then, I have often thought that this is what could have happened to Brenda. When the time came when he wanted to get rid of her, being a builder, he would have no doubt found out where she lived. He would have thought a septic tank was an easy place to dispose of her body. There was a public footpath three to four metres from the tank. It would have been very easy to gain knowledge of the tank without suspicion. If there was no crop on the adjacent field, a vehicle could have easily driven right to the tank. This is purely a possibility. When asked to elaborate on this written statement, Venables explained that Brenda's behaviour was not out of the ordinary on the evening of May 2nd, 1982. He told the detectives that he had sat in the living room watching news reports as Brenda played with their new West Highland Terrier puppy. Venables denied that they had any disagreements and claimed they had nothing to argue about. After watching television together, Brenda changed into her pink nightdress and went to sleep next to him in their bed. When I woke up the next morning, she wasn't in bed, Venable said. I went to look and she had just disappeared. I felt perhaps she had gone to see friends. There was no sign of her anywhere. According to Venables, after getting up, he went downstairs and noticed the front door and porch door were open. Brenda had also left her engagement ring on the nightstand. Following a search of the lanes that surrounded the farm, Venables said that he went to the police station later on that day to report Brenda missing, telling detectives, From that day to this, I just don't know what happened to her. I was absolutely devastated when I couldn't find her. She had never done anything like that before. Detectives raised the subject of Brenda's mental state, and Venable said that Brenda's sisters Jane and Rita had six children between them. Brenda wanted children of her own, but had been left devastated when they could not conceive leaving her severely depressed. Officers then questioned Venables about the numerous affairs he was known to have had, including his relationship with a woman called Lorraine Stiles. Venables had met Lorraine when she was working as his elderly mother's carer. When he began driving her home after work, they started a sexual relationship. It lasted over a decade from the late 60s until shortly after Brenda went missing. Despite the longevity of the affair, Venables denied that it was a serious relationship, insisting that it was just casual. One of the detectives responded, Having sex with a woman over a 14-year period? I think she would say that's some sort of relationship. That's not casual. Venables insisted that he had never considered leaving his wife for Lorraine, 
and he did not think Brenda even knew about what was going on. According to Venables, it was not really an affair. Their meetings were never scheduled. She just rang me out of the blue and said, Will you come and see me? I used to take pity on her and just go. I never met anyone who was quite so changeable. Detectives had found a book on Fred and Rose West in Venables' bedroom. When asked what he thought had happened to Brenda, Venables replied, One thing did happen. A lady rang me up. I vaguely knew her. Actually, she used to keep house with a friend I knew. She said Fred West picked her up in Worcester at a bus stop early one morning, and she managed to escape. I wondered since whether he was responsible for picking her up and eventually disposing of her body. Venables claimed he could not remember the woman's name. David Venables was released under investigation while the police tried to establish who the remains belonged to. Unsurprisingly, once DNA tests were complete, they confirmed that the remains belonged to Brenda Venables. Her name was added to her parents' gravestone at St. Michael's Church in Rushok, the same church where she had married David Venables. The year of death was etched in stone as 1982. June 2021 Almost two years had passed and much had happened since Brenda Venables' remains were found. David Venables, who was then 88 years old, was charged with his wife's murder. He was scheduled to appear before Worcester magistrates a week later, after the Crown Prosecution Service authorised the charge. Explaining the purpose of the CPS, Mark Paul, who led the complex casework unit, said, The decision to authorise the charge against the defendant was made after careful consideration of all the available evidence of this complex case and determining that a prosecution is required in the public interest. Mark Paul went on to say, the function of the CPS is not to decide whether a person is guilty of a criminal offence, but to make fair, independent and objective assessments about whether criminal charges are appropriate. David Venables arrived at Worcester Magistrates Court on June 15th, wearing a shirt beneath a tweed jacket. Thick framed glasses and a surgical mask covered his face. He looked frail as he sat in the dock with his hands on his lap. He only spoke to confirm his details. Later that day at Birmingham Crown Court, he was granted bail on the conditions that he stayed at a specific residence, did not apply for a passport, and did not contact prosecution witnesses. Three months later, on September 7th, Venables appeared at Worcester Crown Court for a plea in case preparation hearing. A plea of not guilty was submitted. Until the trial scheduled for the following year, Venables remained a free man while out on bail. The trial began before Mrs Justice Tipples in June 2022 at Worcester Crown Court. Approaching 90, David Venables sat in the dock assisted by his counsel, wearing headphones to help him hear the proceedings. The Crown's case was opened by Michael Burroughs QC. The prosecutor told the jury that Venables had reported his wife missing in May 1982, but only after he had been told to do so by Brenda's longtime friend Vicky Jennings. 
she found Venables unconcerned, doing little in the search for his wife. Speaking about the defendant, Michael Burroughs QC told the court. He said he had awoken that morning and realised she had gone. He said he had not checked with her parents but had already checked with other relatives that she was not with them. After Brenda went missing, Venables told the police she had been wearing a nightgown but day clothes had been found with her remains in the septic tank. The prosecutor explained to the court that without a body or evidence indicating there had been a violent struggle within the house, there was no indication that there had been a murder, so in turn Brenda's case was treated as a missing persons inquiry. Michael Burroughs QC said that David Venables had claimed his wife was severely depressed, and had likely taken her own life, but the prosecution argued it was the defendant who had killed her. According to the prosecutor, it beggared belief to suggest that Brenda had fallen into the septic tank or climbed inside with the intention of killing herself. She had not written a suicide note nor threatened to end her life the night before. There was no evidence of an overdose, and she could have easily entered the waters of the nearby River Severn to take her own life, but she had not. Michael Burroughs QC told the jury, She was not the sort of woman to leave the front door open. She was a prim and proper lady. She wouldn't choose to end her life in a septic tank. Nobody would. That's why pathologists have found no record of anyone committing suicide by climbing into a septic tank. The idea that she may have climbed into the tank voluntarily and somehow moved the heavy lid and somehow put it back into its place above her with no disturbance is one the prosecution say you can safely reject. The prosecutor also dismissed any suggestion that Brenda was killed by a stranger who then concealed her body in the tank when he said she had bad ankles and had hurt her leg. She didn't like walking. She would never choose to walk out of the house at all in the middle of the night. The idea that she got dressed and walked out of the house on her own and confronted someone who attacked and killed her and hid her body in the tank that was hidden from view and that so few people knew about, is fanciful. Michael Burroughs QC told the court about Venable's long-term affair with Lorraine Stiles, which started sometime in 1967 and went on for almost 14 years with brief periods of no contact. According to the prosecutor, the defendant had a motive to kill Brenda because of the affair. Burrow said, He wanted her out of the way. He wanted to resume his long-standing affair with another woman. He knew about the septic tank in its secluded location. It was for him almost the perfect hiding place. It meant he did not have to travel and risk being seen making a suspicious journey around the time of her disappearance, risk being seen disposing of her body somewhere else. And of course, even if someone did think to look inside the tank, her body would be hidden from view. And for nearly 40 years, it was the perfect place, and he got away with murder. By 1982, Lorraine Stiles was moving on, and Venables promised her that he would divorce Brenda. Brenda had been open and transparent with her psychiatrist, Dr. Richards, in February 1982. She told him about the problems she was having at home. Michael Burroughs QC spoke about the psychiatrist's records from the time, saying... His notes indicate that she told him that she did not have a happy marriage and that she and David Venables had not had sexual intercourse since 1979. 
she said he had two affairs. The court heard that Brenda had called the Samaritans around this time because she felt suicidal. Dr. Richards wanted to have her hospitalised, but Venables refused. That said, in the weeks leading up to her death, Brenda had reported feeling a lot better. Dr. Richards described Venables in his notes as being, quote, a typical farmer displaying little to no affection to his wife, but showering praise on the family dog. The prosecutor recounted the circumstances surrounding the discovery of Brenda's remains and what David Venables told the police. Michael Burroughs QC said, He has lied about his relationship with Brenda Venables. It wasn't perfectly normal. They'd not had sexual intercourse since 1979 and had not slept together for three years. He's lied not only about his relationship with Brenda, but lied and downplayed his relationship with Lorraine Stiles. The relationship was of a much greater significance than David Venables was willing to acknowledge. David Venables has lied about the circumstances of Brenda Venables' disappearance and death. Concluding his opening statement, Michael Burroughs QC told the court, Of course, one person you cannot hear from at all is Brenda Venables herself. She died without making any statement, or a suicide note, or otherwise, that might give a clue as to the immediate circumstances of her death. The prosecution say you can tell a lot about the circumstances of her death simply from where her body was found. There was nobody else there other than David Venables. He killed her. He had the motive to kill her. He knew Brenda would never divorce him. To him, Brenda was an obstacle. Farmhands who had been employed by Venables testified. Douglas Robinson had been away when Brenda went missing in 1982, but when he returned he learned about her disappearance. Surprisingly, Robinson told the court that none of the staff had been asked to assist in the search for Brenda. This was corroborated by Trevor Brooks who ran a pig farm owned by Venables and his brother Peter in Defford. Brooks described Brenda as ladylike and said he and his wife had been out to dinner and on holidays with the Venables before. Brooks said that he had left the farm in 1985 but got back in contact with Venables in 2010. Throughout the decade that followed, Brenda's disappearance was never brought up in conversation. Lorraine Stiles, who had an affair with David Venables, provided a statement to the police in 1984. The statement was read in court and detailed how the pair had met him in 1967. She was working as his mother's carer and claimed she did not know Venables was married at the time. The relationship continued for a few years until Lorraine discovered the truth. She had written, One night he called. I noticed a lipstick mark and makeup on his shirt. We never discussed it because I was frightened of losing him. Several days later, I became very depressed, having received a poison pen letter. The letter was from Brenda, who told Lorraine she knew about the affair. Lorraine was devastated and tried to end her life, but thankfully survived. A few weeks later, she went to speak with Brenda at Quaking House Farm to clear the air. Lorraine said... We discussed the situation quite rationally. There were no raised voices. Brenda pointed out David had no intention of leaving the house or family, and my affair had not been the only time. 
she intimated that there had been others. Lorraine decided to move on with her life, but every time she tried, David Venables would show up outside her home in his red triumph and convince her to stay with him. He came to her house multiple nights a week until 1981, when she began a relationship with someone else, a man named Edward Day. Things were going well until Venables began to contact her again. Lorraine said, All of a sudden, just prior to Christmas 1981, David came back on the scene making arrangements on my telephone. He said he missed me and wanted to resume the relationship. He asked to take me out and I agreed. This renewed relationship led to going away for the new year of 1981-82. to The day we returned home, he asked me to give Edward up. He even went so far as to say that he would see his solicitor about a divorce from Brenda and that we could live in his house. I told him that I could never live in his house, so we started discussing buying my house. I believed he was sincere in what he was saying. In February 1982, I finished my association with Edward Day because of the promises that David had given me. He still called around once or twice a week, and we had a normal sexual relationship. However, he was still vague about his home life whenever I brought it up and gave excuses. Lorraine explained that Venables called her on May 5th, 1982 to tell her that Brenda was missing. She said he seemed composed and had spoken about how difficult it was because the farm was busy. Lorraine often contacted him for updates on whether Brenda had been found, but she heard nothing until two weeks later when Venables called at her house. According to Lorraine, he did not want to discuss it. Lorraine wrote in her statement, I couldn't understand why he was so calm about the whole situation. He just sat and watched television. Later in the evening, he eventually got round to making advances towards me. It was quite obvious that he wanted to have intercourse. In view of his wife's disappearance, I refused his advances. I didn't see him for a few weeks again and our relationship continued. I told him I couldn't understand why she had apparently gone to bed quite normally and then without any indication whatsoever she suddenly disappeared without a trace or informing anyone of her intentions. He just answered that by saying that she had been a bit run down with the flu. By December 1982, Lorraine Stiles realised that she was not the only woman in Venable's life. She spotted him leaving a house with someone else, and when she confronted him, he bluntly told her he could see they no longer had anything in common. Lorraine had told detectives, As far as I was concerned, that was the end of my 14-year relationship. Decades later, Lorraine Stiles became terminally ill. In 2014 or 15, she asked a family member to post a letter through Venable's door asking for some company. He came to see her. Venables visited her every Friday for several years until her death in 2017. Lorraine's daughter told the court she heard Venables apologise to her mother for how he had treated her. Testimony from former police officers followed. Retired Superintendent James Ashley from West Mercia Police recalled how the missing person's inquiry had been hampered by miscommunication at the initial stages. He said Venables had been advised to return to the station in the evening if his wife had not returned. 
When he did, it was too late to begin searching as it was getting dark. The dog handlers had been dispatched to the farmhouse and surrounding fields and woods for a few hours. Superintendent Ashley said he had no knowledge of the septic tank and did not believe it had ever been searched. However, he explained that searches had been conducted throughout the farm and along the River Severn as well as aerial searches in a helicopter. PC Dick Schwab had been sent to the farm after Venables had reported his wife missing. Schwab recalled, The gentleman told us that he and his wife had gone to bed and at some time during the night she got up. He described himself as being half asleep and he didn't see her again after that. I seem to recall him saying 2am. I do have a memory of him talking about a holiday that had just happened or was about to happen. Switzerland was the place I seem to recall was mentioned. He was very calm. It was very matter of fact. No real great sign of emotion. No wringing of hands. Just a purely very factual report about what had happened. I recall outside of the house with a colleague who was with me about whether the lady had ran away to the river to self-harm. Some mention must have been made of her mental health. We did a precautionary sweep of the house. I recall going into the bedroom where she had gone missing from. There was nothing unusual about it. The bed was unmade. Retired West Mercia Police Constable Peter Sharrock took the stand next. Sharrock had been part of the search team sent to the farmhouse in 1982. The septic tank was located behind a boundary hedge at the edge of the garden, and it was difficult to notice unless you knew it was there. The former constable recalled seeing a slab of concrete in an overgrown area of the grounds but he did not know what it was at the time as he had grown up in a city and was unaware of how septic tanks worked. Sharrock told the court, At the time it just looked like a pad area of concrete and I didn't pay it any attention. The word is hindsight, really. A case review had been conducted in 1983 by DCI Roger Morris who had since retired. Morris had spoken with David Venables and wrote a statement about their interaction. Quote, He presented himself as a typical gentleman farmer. He said words to the effect of, I'll do whatever I can to help. He was calm, even when I asked him if he was involved in his wife's death. D.C. David Jennings from West Mercia Police had examined the original police files as part of an investigation into potential links to serial killers Fred and Rose West. D.C. Jennings explained that Brenda's name had been passed to the Gloucestershire Police during the West investigation, along with five others from the area who may have been abducted by the couple. Two of those women named on the list were ultimately identified as victims of the Wests, but Brenda did not match the victim profile associated with the notorious serial killers. She was 48 years old, much older than the Wests' victims. The majority of the bodies had been concealed in the Wests' home on Cromwell Street. None had been hidden in a septic tank. David Venable's nephew Andrew testified that he had been 14 when his aunt Brenda went missing, and he did not see her that often because he attended boarding school at the time. He recalled the odd occasion when he came to visit and described Brenda as, quote, very well presented. She was clean and tidy in housework. She was hospitable to me, bringing orange juice and coffee. She was a nice, kind lady. 
Andrew and his wife Jessamy bought the farmhouse in 2014. Venables had offered to sell them the farm seven years earlier in 2007, but they held off on the purchase until after they'd had children. Once the prosecution had presented their case, David Venables' counsel Timothy Hannam QC questioned his client on the stand. The accused testified about his upbringing and the early stages of his relationship with his wife. When asked how he would describe Brenda, Venables said, She was always very pleasant. Whenever you went out, she was always good company and we just got on well together. She was very good looking, just generally appealing. Venables was asked why he had been described as calm and emotionless by the original investigators. He replied, Well, I think I've never been one to show a lot of emotion, ever. I was very concerned about it and very worried but I'm not a person to show emotion. The defendant spoke about why he appeared to have moved on so quickly after his wife's disappearance, telling the court, I had got a job to do. We just had to get on with what we were doing. It was a complete mystery to us where she'd gone. Explaining why he had never mentioned the septic tank to investigators, Venable said it never entered his mind. However, he claimed to have seen the police searching it twice in 1982. He recalled that at a later date he replaced the access cover with a paving slab because it was close to a public footpath and felt it was a safety hazard. The next topic was something Venables wished to avoid the subject of his infidelity. He was questioned about his affair with Lorraine Stiles. Venables portrayed a feeling of regret to the court, and it was even a word he used when describing what happened. He said that he would not have left Brenda for Lorraine. He spoke of the reasons why listing Lorraine's flaws. She had such a volatile temperament and I found that out many years ago before then. She was friendly enough, but she had an erratic nature. Sometimes she was quite normal, and then she'd be bad-tempered and moody. Venables recounted a time when he claimed that Lorraine had turned up at Quaking House Farm in the months following Brenda's disappearance. She came to my house one day quite unannounced and said, now you're on your own, I can come and live with you. I said, well, that's never going to happen. In fact, she used a lot of verbal abuse to me and got in her car and drove away at great speed down the drive. David Venables denied any involvement in his wife's murder. He claimed that they had a good relationship continuing to share a bed until the night he said she went missing. In closing, Timothy Hannam QC said that it did not make sense for his client to have killed his wife and hid her body in the septic tank on the property, given how close it was to the home. Venable's counsel questioned why the defendant would have sold the farm if he knew Brenda's body was in the septic tank, and why he would have employed someone to empty it and add an extra chamber to it before selling the property in 2014. Annam said, Everything he has done since is inconsistent with him putting Brenda in the septic tank. Who in their right mind would ask someone to empty a septic tank knowing that their wife's body was in it? Who on earth would do that? The barrister pointed out that even a friend of Brenda's thought she had killed herself at the time. Annam told the jury, 
It is far from incredible that she may have chosen to kill herself in the septic tank, and it has to be incredible for you to dismiss that as a possibility. It was very close to the house. Referring to the prosecution's statement about there being no suicide note, Timothy Hannam QC stated, In Brenda's mind there was an uncaring husband and no children to apologise to. Suicide, we say, cannot fairly be dismissed out of hand. Hannam told the jury that the only fair verdict would be one of not guilty. There was no direct evidence whatsoever of how Brenda Venables came to die or about how her body came to enter the septic tank. The Crown's case is circumstantial. We say it's based on a series of assumptions mixed with guesswork and speculation. After five weeks of legal proceedings, the jury of five men and seven women retired to consider the evidence. They returned on July 15th after 17 hours of deliberations they had reached a majority decision. The 89-year-old defendant showed no emotion in the dock as the verdict was read aloud. David Venables was found guilty of the murder of his wife, Brenda. Following the verdict, Brenda's family released a statement through West Mercia Police. Brenda's nieces and nephews described how David Venable's lies and fabrications had been revealed, and justice had finally been served after a wait of 40 years. They thanked everyone who had worked on the case in the years since Brenda's body was found. We feel utter horror and despair that Brenda was murdered. She was no harm to anyone being a gentle and increasingly quiet woman. We'll never know how she died or how much she suffered. We pray her death was quick. The torment of her body being found in the septic tank of her house will never leave us. It haunts our nights. We cannot come to terms with her being put in such a repulsive and shocking place. And then, by continuing to use the septic tank, her murderer dishonoured her dead body every day for 30 years after murdering her. Venables robbed Brenda of the second half of her life and robbed her of any dignity in death. By concealing Brenda's remains, he made her family live through the hell of not knowing what had happened to her and robbed the family of the opportunity to bury Brenda for over 37 years. In that time, many close family members have died. Other women were hurt by Venable's shockingly repugnant attitude to women. Brenda knew about his affairs during their marriage. In 1982, the attitude to missing women was different. In this case, Brenda's husband was seen. Coercive control was not a term used or understood in the 1970s and early 80s. We wish we had sensitively asked her about how life was for her. For many women ground down and controlled by someone else, leaving is an unattainable fantasy. However, there are good people out there who can and will help. Brenda's loved ones wished that she had never come to meet David Venables and imagined Brenda living a life filled with joy and happiness. They ended their statement. After 40 long years, we pray that you can at last rest in peace, Brenda. Detective Sergeant James Beard spoke on behalf of West Mercia Police and said that they welcomed the verdict and also felt that justice had been done. D.S. Beard said, The terrible truth is that Brenda was killed by the person who was meant to care for her most. 
He then let her family and friends go for so long, not knowing what happened to her. They were robbed of a sister and auntie and left without closure for 40 years. We cannot begin to imagine the pain that must have caused them, and I'd like to commend them for the courage and dignity they have shown throughout the investigation and the court proceedings. So where are we now? It was agreed David Venables could watch the sentencing hearing via video link because of health concerns. However, due to technical issues, the hearing had to be delayed for three hours as he was transported from HMP Hill to attend. At the hearing, it was revealed that Venables had tried to deceive psychiatrists into believing he was unfit to plead at his trial. The scores he had achieved on the psychometric tests were lower than would be expected, even from someone suffering from severe dementia. Venables had been living independently his entire life, and so the judge believed he was deliberately trying to mislead the psychiatrist into thinking his cognitive abilities were lower than they were. The prosecutor listed what he saw as the aggravating circumstances – concealing Brenda's body and the fact that Brenda should have felt safe in her own home. Despite the verdict, Venable's defence barrister Timothy Hannam QC asked for leniency from the judge. The simple fact of the matter is that he is 89 years old and whatever minimum term is imposed today, he will die in prison. The defence had submitted that the killing could have been committed in the heat of the moment, and the concealment an act of panic. Mrs Justice Tipples addressed Venables as she began her sentencing remarks. She spoke about the impact Brenda's disappearance had on her elderly parents, who died without knowing what had happened to their daughter. The judge believed Venables had killed Brenda on Saturday the 1st or Sunday the 2nd of May in 1982 and then dragged her fully clothed body across the garden before putting it into the septic tank. He then dropped a manhole cover weighing 42 pounds on top of her to ensure her body was not found. It was believed Venables covered it with a concrete slab before Monday the 3rd when Brenda's friend Vicky came over to visit. Vicky had been asked to check on Brenda by her concerned parents. The judge concluded that Venables had taken advantage of Brenda's depression to make the police believe she had taken her own life. Mrs Justice Tipples dismissed the defence's argument that the murder could have been committed in the heat of the moment, and that Venables had hidden the body in a state of panic. Addressing the defendant, she stated, The whole process of disposing of her body in the septic tank and leaving no trace whatsoever of what you had done must have required considerable thought and planning and preparation. This was not something you did on the spur of the moment. I'm also sure that you gave thought as to when to report Brenda missing, and you delayed doing so in order that any scent from moving her body across the garden to the tank would have vanished by the time the police dogs turned up to search the area around your home, which you knew would happen. Mrs Justice Tipples spoke about how Venables had been responsible for Brenda's fragile mental state because his affairs were obvious. The judge noted how when Venables went away with Lorraine Stiles for New Year's Eve in December 1981, he got Brenda to pack his suitcase. Mrs Justice Tipples also addressed the fact that Venables had strung Lorraine along with false promises when she said, You gave Lorraine the impression that you wanted to settle down with her, 
and you told her that you would see a solicitor about getting a divorce from Brenda so that you could live in the house together. Lorraine told you that she did not want to live in Quaking House Farm, so you started discussing buying her house in Warden, so you would have somewhere to live with Lorraine after you had divorced Brenda. You also told Lorraine Stiles that you had seen a solicitor about the divorce and had been told that it wouldn't be easy and would take time because of the business factor. The judge mentioned how Brenda was particularly vulnerable at the time of her death. She had been suffering from the flu and had recently fell down the stairs injuring her leg. Brenda already had arthritis which caused her ankle problems. Quote, On the 1st of May 1982, Brenda's mother was so worried about her daughter that she called Vicky Jennings and asked her to help the family out and go and see Brenda and take her out. Vicky Jennings agreed to do so and planned to see Brenda as soon as she could, which was on the bank holiday Monday the 3rd of May 1982. However, when she rang Quaking House Farm, she was too late. You answered the telephone that morning and, for the first time, you told the lies you had concocted to explain Brenda's disappearance and then played on the fears of others that Brenda had, in the words of Vicky Jennings, done something stupid and killed herself. No one dreamt that the real risk to Brenda was you, the smartly dressed gentleman farmer and the man she had been married to for almost 22 years. The judge said Venables had killed Brenda so she was no longer part of his life, removing the complications of divorce proceedings. After claiming she disappeared, Venables had filed for an annulment of their marriage. Before imposing a mandatory life sentence, the judge told Venables, Your complete lack of respect for Brenda is obvious from your decision to dispose of her body in the septic tank. That tank, as you knew, contained the sewage from your own home, which was added to every day by your effluent. The fact that is what you did with her body is disgusting and repulsive, and unsurprisingly something that those members of her family who are still alive have found very distressing and extremely difficult to bear. The defence had argued any sentence would be a whole life tariff at Venable's age, but the judge responded, In my view, you are a man who is relatively robust for your chronological age, and I do not accept that your life expectancy must be short. There is no evidence of that before me, and there is no evidence of your anticipated life expectancy. You have been able to carry on your own life and do as you pleased for over 37 years after you murdered Brenda. You committed the gravest of crimes by killing her, and the lives of family and friends were blighted by the consequences of what you did. You have shown no remorse at all for what you have done. David Venables was ordered to serve a minimum of 18 years in prison. As he was led from the courtroom towards the cells, he could be heard repeatedly shouting no. Venables will be 107 years old when he is eligible to apply for parole. Thank you for listening. A special thanks to our new Patreon producer Sarah Thompson and all our patrons for their support. For more information on this episode, please see the show notes or visit our website, theywalkamonguspodcast.com. <laughs>